So my talk is entitled Everyone Knows That Everyone Knows. So it's about um, certain uh, uh, protocols with epistemic goals, higher order epistemic goals. And I present this in the setting of uh, gossip protocols. And I should say that it's uh, partially based on shared work with uh, the, brother, the brothers Ramazanian and with Malvin Gattinger, who is also present uh, at the talk, I presume. And um, given that I have uh, an urgent uh, departure point, he is welcome to answer any questions that I um, may not have answered yet at that stage. OK, so um, here we go. A uh, gossip protocol, given a number of agents, where each has one secret to share, um, consists of these agents calling each other and then exchanging all the secrets they know. And already a, a method of terminology, an agent who uh, get well, who knows all the secrets, I call an expert. And um, a, a sequence of telephone calls, uh, um, after which all the agents are experts, I call successful. And I will use this more or less interchangeably with uh, terminal. And um, given that there are very many, it's an old subject from the, at least around the year 1970 onward, it's an old subject with many variations. So instead of exchanging secrets, you can have that uh, only the caller informs the person that is being called, uh, so-called push, or the other way, only the caller gets information from the person being called. And the secret exchange is known in the community as push-pull. Um, also, you have a difference between uh, uh, settings where there is explicit time, uh, which uh, allows you to get more information from uh, a sequence of telephone calls, and, and the settings wherein there is no notion of time, except that all the agents themselves have their local notion of time. Uh, so that will be a fully distributed uh, setting. And there's also something in between where uh, you make calls in rounds, and um, which typically means that all the agents make the call at the same time, and they have some way to uh, to gather all the results if an agent that is being called receives more than one call. Yeah, but I will not talk on that very much either. Um, another restriction is that, uh, for example, agents can only call their neighbors. And uh, well, you might say the people from whom they have the telephone numbers, this affects, um, um, well, the, the, the results for, uh, for duration, like the number of calls needed to achieve a certain goal uh, or the expectation of certain protocols. Um, the, the thing I want to talk about is mainly about some work on epistemic gossip protocols, where epistemic actually can mean a number of different things. Um, because it could be that the condition in order to make a call wherein you exchange secrets is, has, is epistemic, it depends on, on information. Um, but it could also be that the, the goal uh, of the protocol is epistemic, uh, which is indeed the topic of this talk. Everyone knows that everyone knows, a higher order epistemic goal. But it could also be that the message is epistemic so that you do not merely exchange secrets, but also information about these secrets. Hmm? About this, I will also not talk very much, but I will certainly mention it. Okay, having said that, um, it's unavoidable. <laughs> Simplest example that is non-trivial, let's have four agents, A, B, C, D. Then four calls are sufficient to distribute all secrets over all agents. Um, I represent what these agents know as a subset relative uh, to uh, the, the order of agents in, in some uh, array or sequence uh, of, of the agents of who they know the secrets. So if call AB is made, then A and B both know two secrets. If call CD is made, then C and D both know two secrets, namely of each other. Then if call from A to C is made, then A and C know all secrets, they are experts, and after call BD, everybody is an expert. Okay, these are four calls. It's known that the minimum number is 2n minus 4, already since the 1970s. I think Tideman is 71. And, and there's actually some nice, somewhat later work that does this on the, with Hasse diagrams using actually partially, the, well, the departure, partial order induced by such a call sequence. For example, if you see AB before CD, you, well, this, these calls could be in either order, so it only matters that they are made independently. Um, 
if, for example, the first two calls overlap, yeah, here the agent A occurs in both calls, then it will take more than the minimum number of calls, and in this case, more than four. And also, nothing is ruled out in principle, right? If you keep repeating the same call, AB, 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 it goes on forever. Mm -hmm. So this is, you might say, uh, opens the area, well, indeed, of, of, of well, having schedules or, or planning uh, these call sequences. Right? So this is the, the relevance to, uh, well, today's workshop and the topic uh, in general. And, <coughs> and of particular interest is if all the agents, um, you might say, are independently uh, acting, if it's a distributed system, and for example, all calls are being made randomly, uh, what then the expectation is of termination. And the number of n log n comes with that, which is, well, you might say is known as the, the coupon collector uh, uh, problem. Uh, the, the number of n log n comes with that because it's the, well, the number of, you might say, um, um, times you have to uh, uh, do something in order to contact each of these n uh, participants. And there is a fairly straightforward way in which the number of calls you have to make to uh, well, terminate a protocol hey, is related to actually the probability of contacting a particular caller at least once. Uh, this, this in fact works by the ability to, to make, well, to connect any two nodes uh, in a network um, by um, making more and more of these uh, random calls and then um, building some sort of Markov chain that you finally uh, makes you reach the, the arbitrary other agent, and then you have to do it all the way back, yeah, but both are n log n, so that remains n log n. Um, what, what is interesting in the community is that you can push this barrier n log n uh, down to log square of n, but on, well, particular complex network arrangements that I cannot explain because I even do not fully understand them at the moment, but I find it interesting to mention because I would, find it a challenge that with epistemic protocols, uh, epistemic gossip protocols, it may be possible to uh, push the, down this boundary even further. Yeah, so this is a reason to mention this here. Um, okay, epistemic uh, gossip protocols. The idea is that, um, um, well, I, I could come up with at least three ways in which a gossip protocol could be epistemic. Maybe there are more, actually, than I think. So one is that the, the, the conditions for making a call epistemic, yeah? or the goal of the protocol is epistemic, or the information exchange is epistemic. Calling preconditions uh, for this, well, quite a few uh, have has been investigated already, but you might say the variation is infinite because, um, well, you can have an arbitrary complex, uh, very much higher order epistemic call condition. Um, the, the protocol known as LNS, uh, then you only call an other agent if you do not know the secret of that agent. Um, I always thought this is, um, it looks like the, the condition known in the community as, as no ho, no one calls uh, her own. Um, and actually, while preparing this talk, I realized that they are identical. I didn't realize that before. So in anything I've written on this topic, this is incorrectly omitted. So this protocol is much older. Yeah, I hope I will not be uh, forced to withdraw this statement, but I always find it embarrassing to find out that something I thought was fairly new has already been done 50 years ago, right? Uh, you don't want this. Um, another one um, is call me once. So in fact, this is a history-based uh, criterion. So you cannot call someone you who, with whom you have already been in a call. And uh, a more really epistemic criterion is that you can call an agent if you consider it possible that you can tell a new secret to that agent or if that agent can tell a new secret to you. Um, okay, not all uh, protocol conditions that are epistemic are, uh, you might say, felicitous because you would typically require that it is um, well knowledge-based so that the uh, agent making the call knows that the criterion is satisfied that she requires. Yeah? So if the criterion is that you may call an agent if that agent doesn't know your secret, um, then the condition may hold, but you don't know this. Um, let us think just for a, a, a short minute. Oh, and by the way, you indeed may interrupt me at any stage with questions, right? Even whether they are cut out or not, I, I like this. No problem whatsoever. Um, 
suppose you haven't made any call whatsoever. Um, well, then this condition is satisfied, right? Because any other agent that you will call will not know your secret. Okay, but now consider any later situation during the execution of that protocol. Um, at least one agent now knows your secret. So that agent may have called many other agents and you don't know what. So if you now call an arbitrary other agent, it's possible that that other agent doesn't know your secret, then the condition is fulfilled, or that other agent um, actually knows your secret and the condition is not fulfilled. Yeah, but you cannot know this. So this is not uh, a knowledge-based uh, precondition. Um, okay. Apart from uh, epistemic preconditions, we have, have epistemic goals. And this is more the topic uh, I'm interested in uh, here and uh, now. Um, so usually the goal is just distribution of all secrets. Everyone knows all secrets. The word knows is maybe even slightly inappropriate here because it, it's merely that everyone holds all secrets. Eh? This is just an, an, a stack of uh, things in your uh, local memory. Eh? To call this knowledge is maybe uh, a bit so so. Um, but now consider that you want um, you, you, you actually want to have some confirmation, some acknowledgement that everybody knows all secrets. Eh? Um, so you want actually the goal to be that everyone knows that everyone knows all secrets. So this is really epistemic, and from the, the, the epistemic that we see here, it's even second order, right? So <coughs> this is a, a stronger goal. Um, also, in the remainder of the talk, I will call such agents super experts. Yeah, An agent who knows all secrets is an expert. An agent who knows that everyone knows all secrets is a super expert. Yeah? So a super expert knows that everybody is an expert. And a call satisfying uh, that this condition holds is then called super successful. Um, let us have an example. Um, and we use the same agents and we start in the same way. And we have A calls B and then C calls D and then A calls C and B calls D. Now they know all secrets. Now what does A know need to do to confirm that this is the case? Um, you might say no further information being available on this. Well, A then has to call the other agents, um, apart from the agent C that you already called, to, conf to then, you might say, get all these secrets from those other agents. So A has also to call B and D. Um, and B would then still have to call C, because B knows this from D, and B knows this from A, but not from C. Now C has been in a call with A and in a call with B, but not yet in a call with D to confirm this, yeah, because the first call CD, they were both not experts, but she has to make a final call CD, and then indeed everybody knows that everybody uh, is, is an expert. Um, so if we look at this a bit closer, then you see that uh, the first four was the standard way to make everybody an expert, right? But the final two of these first four were calls after which the agents making that call became expert. And um, a, a simple way to uh, make everybody a super expert is that um, everybody is involved in a call with someone else, uh, after which they are both expert. But it is saying that you have for any pair of agents from all agents to make that call. That's n over two calls. Um, so that's the n over two that we see here. And actually the other part of my explanation was that, well, in order to make everybody uh, experts as it was done here, the second half of these calls, yeah, already people became expert. So that's half of the known minimum of 2n minus 4. Um, okay, that is indeed the way to get this done. Um, there are other ways to get this done. And in fact, there are much easier ways to get this done if your goal is merely uh, the, the super successful uh, uh, goal and not uh, success, uh, because you can simply take any agent and call all other, let that agent call all other agents, then um, call them back and <coughs> make the remaining number of pairs uh, of agents that you haven't had yet. 
well, I, I can explain this in more detail, but I'm already begin, becoming worried that I will run out of time. So uh, let me not explain this in too much detail. Anyway, you can uh, uh, read part of this up in a manuscript. Everyone knows that everyone knows. That is currently not yet available to uh, be read, but uh, uh, hopefully this will uh, happen sometime soon. Um, working, um, continuing on the same example, and now looking at the other way to be epistemic, we could also the messages uh, be epistemic. Well, this is very nice work, um, typically involving uh, Andreas Hetzi, uh, so he's invisible as an author for the, the second publication. Um, <coughs> above, we had the example we just saw, right? Four agents where, um, well, afterwards everybody's a super expert. And uh, remember that I said that this involves at least um, for all pairs of agents from the set of agents to make that call. That's n over two, that's quadratic. So this is a quadratic, uh, uh, you might say, um, uh, uh, well, uh, order of uh, calls that you have to make in order to achieve uh, being uh, super successful. Now look at that same uh, um, execution of, of calls again. and, and um, let us now allow that instead of merely informing uh, other agents of secrets, you may inform them more, uh, for example, that other agents are experts, uh, that other agents know all secrets. If that is allowed, then fewer calls are already sufficient. Uh, um, we, um, for example, in this call, uh, the second call AB here, uh, which we have as the call AB here, Remember that this is a stage wherein everybody is already an expert. Then instead of A and B informing each other of their secrets, actually A can inform B that A and C are experts, that A and C know all secrets, because that happened in the call AC. And B can inform A that B and D are experts, because that happened in the call BD. So then A knows, well, that B is an expert, that C is an expert, and that B is an expert, so A is now a super expert. And for the symmetric reason, B also knows that everybody uh, is an expert. So now the goal is already satisfied that agents A and B know that all agents know all secrets. And the call AD here is no longer necessary. Um, well, in a similar way, uh, let me uh, here uh, speed on a bit, we can um, also remove one more call, this call BC, and the call CD is sufficient to make everybody an expert. Uh, because then C informs D not only of all the secrets, but also that A uh, knows all secrets, and D also informs C that um, B knows all secrets. So then we are done. And now, if you, uh, well, if, if you look at this a bit more closely, we can do this in linear time if you look at the minimum execution time. Hmm? It, it might be interesting, by the way, which is why I mentioned this expectation on random scheduling. If you have certain um, um, if protocols that do this uh, systematically and you look at where in some uh, parts of the protocol are random, eh? for example, who you select to call if you have insufficient information and what then the uh, uh, relative expectation is from this and this. Yeah, so I would expect this to remain quadratic and here I would not be sure what would happen. Yeah. It might be n log n or it might be quadratic, I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay, more on um, everyone knows that everyone knows. Yeah, and now we get a bit more into the actually the, 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 well, the details of this, this work with uh, Rahim and Malvin. Um, because uh, another thing that seemed interesting to uh, to model, well, from a perspective of, of efficient multi-agent systems and an acknowledgement or no need of acknowledgement um, or, or uh, dead or alive processes, the idea is that once you're an expert, you, you stop being interested. So you no longer answer calls, you just go home. Yeah, you no longer make calls because you already know everything. Um, well, um, in itself, that seem, doesn't seem to mean very much because if you then were to call another agent, then you'd simply get no response. But now you suppose you know that this means that the other agent has already gone home because that agent is an expert. 
um, then it becomes meaningful because instead of the uh, example that I already showed, uh, um, consisting of eight calls, um, then at the moment, uh, after this call AD here, when uh, A is a super expert, A goes home, and we can now have B, C, and D call A, uh, uh, either uh, uh, scheduled or accidentally, and uh, these calls are not answered, but then all these other agents be get to know from this missed call, so to speak, that uh, everybody is an expert. Um, of course, the whole thing of this is that this should be common knowledge among the agents, that this is how to interpret that if you call an agent, the other one doesn't answer the call. Yeah, so this... Um, <coughs> um, well, uh, this we have to model, and we will, but let us just for a moment contrast this with the same uh, feature, but now missed calls <coughs> are made by uh, agents the moment they know all secrets, but not the moment they know that everybody knows all secrets. And I realized that I was actually uh, uh, miss uh, saying that uh, in the previous slide. So the, the idea is that you, you go home, um, once you know that, well, everybody has received all the secrets. So once you are a super expert, you no longer uh, um, answer calls and you no longer make calls. Um, so on that condition, eh, we have, you might say, a good and a bad uh, modeling solution. So once you call a super expert, eh, a super expert is one who knows that everybody's an expert. So then you are also already an expert because otherwise the person you're calling can't be a super expert. Um, <coughs> but it also means you already know all the secrets, so even if no secret exchange is made, nothing is lost. Um, but in the other uh, condition, that if you uh, stop calling once you are an expert, uh, which I incorrectly said on the previous slide, um, then you can be in trouble because if you call it an expert, uh, given those conditions, you're not yet an expert yourself. So presumably you called this other person because you want to learn a new secret from that person. But as the call is not answered, you haven't learned the secret, so you're still not an expert. So, so it's not a good idea to have this uh, uh, condition, even if it's common knowledge among the agents, that um, uh, experts do not answer calls. Um, oh, that was too fast. Uh, so just a bit more on protocol knowledge. So I'm going to introduce a language where instead of uh, A knows phi, then we have a primitive for A knows phi given that protocol P is common knowledge. Um, you have to be somewhat careful in defining this because a protocol, uh, a gossip protocol, here is some program of a shape that until all agents are super experts, select some agents such that some condition is satisfied and execute that call. Uh, but this condition to be satisfied, that something that is to be true after a call sequence in, in well, in, in the semantics, so to speak, but um, that means that this, in order to determine the truth of a knowledge formula, you refer to a protocol um, <coughs> which is defined uh, using notions from the semantics involving truth. So we have to be uh, careful in setting this up properly. A very straightforward way to see that this can be set up properly is that you even don't think of uh, simultaneous uh, induction or recursion, but simply see this uh, A knows P, A, well, A knows phi relative to P as not a modality with one argument phi, um, but a modality with, uh, well, n over 2 plus n arguments, namely for all calling conditions, uh, um, wherein uh, two different agents, B, C, uh, have to satisfy some formula. Uh, so, so in a way you represent the entire protocol by all the protocol conditions for any pair of agents. In principle, these can be different formulas. They can all be uh, uh, symmetric, but they don't have to be. And then it's just uh, an operator with many uh, arguments. Um, details of that are in some other work called strengthening gossip protocols, and um, of which I will also not uh, say very much more. 
Um, let us, um, well, mainly work in this token. So here, uh, also by example. So uh, take this protocol, CMO, for call me once. Okay? So you may only be involved once in a call with other agents. Um, well, that relates to the, the, the number of pairs you can pick from a collection of n things, which is n over 2. Uh, so that, that limits the maximum number of calls. And, um, and a maximal sequence of that kind is this sequence consisting of six calls. Um, <coughs> I don't make the computation, but after this sequence, everybody is an expert. Uh, so, so this is also known from the literature. Um, but if the protocol is common knowledge, and, well, and if time is also common knowledge, then, well, then, then, then it's common knowledge, in fact, that after six calls, everybody's an expert. So then it's common knowledge that everybody's an expert, right? Okay, so, so we want actually some system that guarantees that. Well, uh, this can be done. Um, but if it's not, well, if one of these things is not common knowledge, we don't have this. Uh, this is what I want to explain here. Um, so if we have, um, um, oh, that's, that's really distracting, Thomas. So now you, your head completely disappears in the background. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's okay. Um, first look at this last call. The last call involves A and C, right? Now, if there's no notion of time, B and D don't know that this last call took place, right? Because for them, the reality ends after call BD. The last call is necessary to make everybody an expert, so therefore B and D don't know this, so we can't reach the goal. Um, and other reason, um, replace the call BD by the call CD. Then the last call involving B was here at the beginning, right? So B is not yet an expert. So after this sequence, um, B is still not an expert. Now, agent A <coughs> cannot distinguish according to some notion of distinguishing call sequences, sequence sigma from sequence tau. And this is a perfectly uh, legal call sequence, except that it's not permitted according to the protocol CMO. But even though agent A executes the protocol uh, CMO, it's not common knowledge. So agent A doesn't know that agent C and D also execute the protocol CMO. So without common knowledge of the protocol, there's a lot less you can conclude from uh, such sequences and comparing. Yeah, therefore, you really need common knowledge of a protocol. Okay. Um, this is the part that um, I will still do, and then I will do a part that I'm going to speed up. This is the language. Um, it's nothing much, actually. It's just a version of PDL. We have some atoms. Right, we have programs, and the programs are doing uh, the standard things you want. PDL with test. Uh, well, and, and some some weird primitives because here the primitives are calls, uh, so it's not arbitrary reactions. Uh, and some other weird primitives are the the atoms. Well, this is the always true formula. Um, I'm, I'm assuming all the time you can see my mouse moving uh, on the screen, right? Is that uh, correct? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And um, this primitive S A B stands for uh, A knows the secret of B. And this primitive CAB stands for the call AB took place sometime in the past. Eh? So if you evaluate this in some call sequence, then the call AB should be a member of that sequence. Yeah. Um, so I can, well, I can all already see uh, Andreas thinking, but then you need a converse modality, but we sort of trick, uh, it's, it's a temporal logic trick, right? So if the call happened, you make a fresh atom true, that remains true forever, and that is the atom CAB. So we, we don't do contrast here. Could be more interesting, but this is uh, as far as it goes. Um, okay, and then you can define a lot of things by abbreviation. And then the protocol just says, as long as not everybody is a super expert, well, as long as there's someone who is not a super expert and the protocol condition is satisfied, make that call. And it terminates when everybody is a super expert. This says that everybody knows that everybody is an expert. Okay. The semantics is the part I will um, um, do quickly. The main thing about the semantics is that um, we have a clause for knowledge, which not surprisingly is interpreted as um, 
and, and, and sigma and tau, I didn't say this, are, are sequences of codes. Yeah? So AB, um, semicolon CB, etc. Yeah? So it says that, okay, um, agent A knows phi relative to protocol after call sequence sigma, if and only if phi is true, yeah? um, after any call sequence tau for all indistinguishable tau, and oh, he should be a, a, a P relative to a protocol P. You see, I have to uh, um, um, correct these slides. See, these are brand new slides, partially. Yeah. Um, essential is that the P reoccurs here uh, with the indistinguishability system. Yeah. And, and this relation, this epistemic relation, here the P is present, yeah, is then interpreted, well, it has been built independently, so to speak, from the, 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 the prefix call sequences of sigma and tau by clauses that look that if you already have two sequences that are indistinguishable and the, the set of secrets for uh, agent B is the same in sigma and tau, then if A is not yet a super expert and the call condition from A to B is satisfied and <coughs> And this is also the case for a uh, call sequence uh, at tau because it, it, you want some sort of uniformity there. Um, and also, now here is a, a, an opening parenthesis uh, 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 missing. And if um, um, either B is not a super expert in both sigma and tau or B is a super expert in both sigma and tau, uh, so which determines whether B will answer or not the call, then the consequence of uh, adding call AB to sigma and tau are indistinguishable. This requires a lot maybe of explanation. I will not uh, do this, but the idea is that the blue part uh, represents that super experts do not make calls. The green part represents the, 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 the calling condition of the particular protocol and that this is common knowledge in the semantics. And the red part models that super experts do not answer calls. In particular, if like in Sigma, B was already a super expert, so this red thing is satisfied. And that means that this AB will be interpreted by B not answering the call. That means that A should not consider it possible that in some indistinguishable sequence style, B would have answered the call. No, no, then, then, B can, then actually A should learn that B is a super expert. Yeah. Um, more in detail is here, and this is the part I'll skip. And this is the other part I'll skip. Yeah, so you can do this formally and then you get this, yeah, but this I don't want to do here. And the one thing I want to point out, so there's the, the double the squiggle relation, which is for relations where the time is counted explicitly. And there's the single squiggle relation where we have asynchronous uh, uh, gossip protocols, which you can see by having two sequences of some length being indistinguishable, and then you just add a call BC to one, but not the other sequence, right? So this is a way to compare sequences of different length, which opens a number of interesting problems, uh, how to compare um, uh, sequences within an equivalence class for an agent, because that equivalence class is infinite. Yeah? And um, we will get more to that. In particular, it creates problems how to do this uh, by model checking, uh, an asynchronous model checker. But we know where we don't have this, but we can uh, model check uh, things about asynchronous protocols with a model check. Yeah. Um, a number of further things one can say is that um, unlike usually for the K operator, we don't have that K phi implies phi. This is because if you, uh, calls can be executed anyway, if they're permitted or not. If they're executed when not permitted, then anything follows because the relation is empty there. Uh, no further explanation. Um, the other thing is that um, here the, 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 the parameter P uh, is missing, that if B is already a super expert and A calls B, uh, so that, that B um, doesn't answer the call, that makes A a super expert. Uh, so this is a typical validity you would expect. For the protocols we have seen, we have a number of conditions in this language. Uh, learn new secrets if A doesn't know the secret of B. Call me once if uh, they haven't been involved, well, there hasn't been a call AB and there also hasn't been a call BA, fine. Consider it possible, etc. 
the alt k you get by the protocol any, where you can make any call. What sort of results do we have for this uh, uh, setting? Um, and here, the, uh, the, the, the few things I said about uh, 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 minimum uh, execution length and expected ter termination, uh, uh, well, at least come partially back in the results. So some of the protocols we have seen, like any and this peak, possible information growth, are indeed super successful. Yeah, so all executions on the assumption of fair scheduling uh, terminate. And um, also, um, this protocol call me once is super successful. Yeah, I gave the example that if you know, don't have a notion of time, it's not. And if the protocol is not known, it's also not. Yeah, so it's essential that the time is known, synchronous, and that the protocol is known. Yeah? So the uh, protocol where we assume that protocol is common knowledge, I know not called known protocol. Yeah? So this is known CMO. And um, then you can um, uh, easily show that um, under conditions where you have time, this time really adds more information. So synchronous ME allows shorter execution uh, sequences than the asynchronous one. Yeah, where the, the basic, most simple example is, is that if you have these three agents and you make these four calls, well, then you already get a super success. Yeah? But as agent uh, A is not involved in the last call, um, agent A doesn't know <coughs> this if you re remove this one. So synchronously, this will be all right. Yeah? But asynchronously, this one is not all right because, um, well, and then, then there's no notion of time. Um, okay, maybe this was a bit too quick. So if we have the call of sequence of three calls, then with A, B, A, C, A and C become experts. And then with the third call A, B, as there are only three agents, C doesn't know, C was not called, so C knows that the call between two agents must have taken place. And as there are only two other agents, that must be the call A, B. But then all agents know that this is a sequence, so then it is indeed super successful. Um, the other example I gave that protocols with engaged agents, these missed call things, uh, may terminate faster. Um, but this can also go wrong, and let us quickly go why uh, this can go wrong, because uh, otherwise the time goes wrong. Um, and, and let me mention that we obtained these results with a model checker, uh, uh, Christ and Gomachi for a, um, a, a well-known town in Nepal. This is a picture of Gomachi. Yeah. Um, okay, look at this um, graph and this will end um, my um, uh, main part of the talk. This is, you might say, the execution graph for um, a, a, a schema, it's simplified. For the protocol, call me once, where you only can make a, a call with another agent once. And um, here we have um, a part where call sequences are of length six, and here we have a part where call sequences are of length five. Yeah? Um, one can show, and, and, and I wanted to spend five minutes on this, but I don't. One can show actually that after these six calls here, it's common knowledge that, um, <coughs> we have termination. Whereas after the sequence of five here, it's also common knowledge that we have termination. What, what do the capital letters mean? Well, the small letters means collecting the secrets and the capital letters means that um, these agents become experts. Yeah? So if we take uh, just one thing here, if we have C calling D here, C knows A, B, C, and D knows D. So after that, they both know A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. So now C and D are experts, right? Well, if, and, and they know this uh, from each other. Yeah? Even agents know that everybody is an expert, we have A, B, C, and D here. So here, A, C, and D are um, uh, super experts, but not yet B. And the problem with this analysis is that call A, C is allowed, but, a is already a super expert, so might will not make this call with the engaged agent semantics and would then prevent B from becoming an expert, super expert, because that's not yet the case. And there's a way to solve this, uh, which is uh, in the paper. Um, and that's it. Uh, 